So welcome everyone uh, at the fifth webinar of the Anthropological Association of the Netherlands. Um, and this uh, webinar of today is about anthropological perspectives on growth and degrowth. And I thank you all very much for being here and taking the time and making the time to tune in um, and to join for this very interesting dialogue. So before I uh, present the speakers of today, I would like to uh, say a few words from, from where uh, this uh, webinar came from. So, of course, uh, we are 50 years beyond the limits to growth. And it seems that many things did not progress. At the other hand, we have uh, now some very interesting debates on, on a post-growth and a degrowth uh, uh, future. Um, and so um, I think uh, after many years of hegemony of of a like the growth conundrum we are now seeing, this is uh, crumbling. Even the eco economists recently mentioned that um, the, uh, we're not anymore in, in love with growth. Uh, we as being uh, uh, governments, increasing amount of governments and politicians, um, and also of course movements and 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 and, and, and scholars. So uh, there is this new uh, view and 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 and, um, and proposal on the block, which is degrowth, and it has been already um, being debated for uh, quite uh, um, I think over almost some decades, but like it became really popular over the last decade, and so um, we we thought it would be interesting to take this uh, debate um, to um, to discuss what the role and, and what this might imply for the work of anthropologists. So how do anthropologists engage um, um, with the conceptual body and also the, the, mo the movement of degrowth, but also what kind of theoretical or uh, methodological or political contributions can anthropology make as a discipline to this? Uh, future to a degrowth future or post growth society. At the same time, we see that while well, there's a much, well, well, uh, there's much buzz about growth, uh, we see that, uh, of course, in many contexts where we work, um, um, growth is still a very hegemonic desire and, and, and uh, also a, 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 like a, a presence uh, of growth is, is there. So, uh, we want to also well, uh, take into this conversation, what does that mean? How can we um, uh, kind of sustain an engagement with theorization of growth while also thinking about post-growth and degrowth uh, futures? So that is uh, what is on the table today. Um, and we have four, uh, four excellent speakers joining us. Um, to uh, to well to take the, us into this debate, take us into their work on this, um, and so I will present them to you briefly um, before we go into um, into the um, into the dialogue. dialogue. Um, so first, we here we have Lis Alcanya Stevens. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology of KU Leuven. And she's also a resource fellow at the Witch Institute for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg. Um, and uh, well, her work focuses on decolonial alternatives to growth in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, um, and also exploring the possibilities for a post-growth anthropology. So that is uh, that is very interesting for our conversation of today, of course. Eric uh, Hirsch is a assistant professor of environmental studies at the Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. So tuning in from the other side of the ocean. Um, and his research focuses on economic growth, actually what it actually looks like in daily life. And recently published a book on this, on um, acts of growth in, uh, in the context of Peru uh, by Stanford University Press. So, uh, welcome also, Eric. And then we have Shivani uh, Cole. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam in anthropology and a visiting researcher at the Royal University of Bhutan. Actually, she's talking to us today from Bhutan and her research is focuses on alternatives to sustainable development post-growth approaches um, and sign, well, in, in Bhutan. Um, so very big welcome from you for you two as well. 
Um, and then uh, also uh, here with us is Joost Beuving. Um, he's a university lecturer at the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies of Radboud University, uh, where he specializes in anthropology uh, of economic life and um, entrepreneurship and depth. So, and also recently, or is about to publish a book on uh, entrepreneurship. So thank you very much for all being here. Uh, my name is Caroline van Teilingen. I also work as a postdoctoral researcher at Radboud University at the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies. And with he us here today is also Jesse Jonkman. He is a, a postdoctoral fellow at Brunswick University um, and at the FU Freie Universiteit uh, Amsterdam. And he's also, we're both part actually of uh, the Dutch Anthropological Association of the Netherlands, uh, ABV, Anthropologen Beroepsvereniging in Dutch. And well, um, that is my introduction of to all of you, but of course we want to like to know um, what, uh, how did you arrive and how do you in your work relate uh, to uh, the debates on degrowth, uh, sorry, and, and growth. Um, for everyone tuning in um, uh, from, well, various places on, on this uh, on this planet. Um, we will first have a, uh, an hour or so or a little less uh, a dialogue uh, around some key questions. And uh, we will open the room after that for Q&A. So please, if you have any questions, what you can do is, uh, well, remind them and you can ask them um, uh, directly uh, after the dialogue. Or you could um, write them in the chat and then one of us will, will pick them up and, and, and um, well, um, pose the question. So, um, yeah, please do uh, and engage and, and um, um, free welcome to, to, uh, to uh, ask questions uh, at the very end. So, um, but yeah, let's first go into, into uh, the work of, uh, of uh, Eric, Lies and, and Shivani and Joost. Um, because how have you... Um, well, as a scholar, but maybe also in your own life, uh, engage in the debates that I just present so on economic growth and degrowth. Could I give Lise the floor first? Sure, thank you. Um, and, and thank you also for the invitation to participate in this discussion today. So um, I've actually come to work on degrowth relatively recently. So I'm a postdoc, as you mentioned, Caroline, and my research is located at the intersection of environmental and medical anthropology, um, with an ethnographic focus on Central Africa and especially on the northwestern provinces of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I've primarily um, worked on experiences of extraction. Um, so uh, from logging and agricultural plantations to um, the kind of displacement that's caused by um, fortress conservation uh, projects. And more recently um, on experiences of extraction connected more to medical humanitarianism and to what's known as Ebola business. Um, but last year, I started a new project which has the title acronym Postgrowth, as you mentioned, um, and which proposes to explore the connections between anthropology and postgrowth or degrowth scholarship and activism, and also to work on um, environmental justice movements in Africa that are challenging growthism um, and uh, green development. And so I wrote the, the funding application for that two years ago. Um, after reading the, I think, is, does someone have their um, audio on? I can hear, I don't know if you can hear, maybe it's, no? Okay, I'll keep going, as long as you can hear me clearly. So um, I wrote the funding application a couple of years ago after reading um, the 2018 Annual Review of Environment and Resources article by Yorgos Kalis and colleagues, um, which laid out kind of the contemporary and growing research on degrowth. And I was really struck by the fact that while, you know, historians and political scientists and obviously economists um, were all contributing to the debate, most of the references to anthropological scholarship was to these kind of classic 20th century texts by like Salins or Maus or Polanyi. Um, so I was interested in exploring, you know, what might contemporary anthropologists have to contribute to the debate. Um, and Excitingly, as you also mentioned, since since writing that, you know, there's actually been um, 
a lot of anthropologists that have been contributing more and more and, and you know, organizing um, panel discussions. And so there's a panel at the ASA UK in a couple of weeks that's organized by um, Ritu Verma and uh, Natasha Kahl called Beyond Critique and Deconstruction. Um, which engages with degrowth. And then there's an anthropology and degrowth two-day conference that's happening also in London um, in June. And then this event. So there's kind of this um, proliferation of, of anthropological um, research now on this topic. And also, um, of course, many anthropologists who were working on these debates before um, and who've been working on them for a long time. So there's a, a special issue in the Journal of Political Ecology that was edited by um, Susan Paulson in 2017. And there's obviously the work of um, Jason Hickel, who is an economic anthropologist and probably one of the best known voices in the degrowth movement. Um, so that was one aspect of the project is to kind of think about post-growth anthropology and, and, and what it might look like. And I think we're going to talk about that um, later today. And then the other aspect of the project is to think about these debates and kind of how they, these theories and movements might be co-constructed with activists and thinkers from the global south. You know, people from the global south are obviously the most impacted not only by climate change um, and environmental change, which is, you know, often the result of resource extraction um, and deforestation, um, but also the impacts of green policies, um, including green extractivism. So I'm thinking especially about Congo, where there's mining for lithium and other minerals for needed for electric cars, and then green grabbing, the appropriation of land um, for environmental ends and other forms of green imperialism. So um, the understandable fear is that if new global policies based on degrowth are drafted without active participation of, of those in the global south, then they might risk becoming yet another form of neo-colonialism and overlooking important, um, you know, components like reparations. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in exploring the potential synergies between post-growth movements and environmental justice movements, uh, especially as they're imagined and practiced by activists in Congo. Thank you very much, Liz, and yeah, we will surely get to uh, some of the points you mentioned. Um, may I now introduce, uh, ask Eric Hirsch, how does, uh, how did you get into the debates about growth and degrowth, and what's your take? Yeah, and again, thank you for um, convening this panel. Thanks, everybody, for joining uh, at whatever time zone you're tuning in uh, on. Um, I feel really grateful to be here. So I feel like I kind of backed into this debate a little bit. Um, I, uh, you know, there was this panel at the American Anthropological Association meetings on degrowth uh, in like 2016 or 15, I think, um, that Susan Paulson, who's uh, least mentioned before, um, was running. And I'm like wondering, well, what is degrowth? What is that? So. Um, uh, that is sort of my entry into the conversation, which has been a lot stronger on your, uh, on the European and uh, African side of the Atlantic Ocean than on my uh, US side, but I think it's picking up a bit here as well. So, um, you know, it took a couple of years of those conversations, um, some writing, in, um, you know, of thinking with uh, the folks in that Journal of Political Ecology special issue. And then uh, uh, some years later, I uh, started to wonder, wait a minute. So we're, we're um, really trying to challenge these basic ideas about growth and sort of this endless uh, unthinking um, flow of exchange and consumption. But are we really talking about like what growth is itself? So I started to wonder, you know, the kind of way that the more research you do, the less you feel like you know about something. That was sort of my experience um, through pairing these conversations with fieldwork in Peru through 2019, realizing I don't know what growth is. And so um, that ended up being my sort of overarching thematic research question for um, what became my book, Acts of Growth, is basically what is growth? And how do we think about it as not just this big, overwhelming statistical abstraction that is orienting economies all over the world, 
but what does it mean to make it feel real in everyday life? And so that I, sort of going from there, I'm trying to build into the debate the fact that um, anthropologists, at least the anthropologists that I know and have been reading and engaged with, it's almost uh, tend to take growth for granted sometimes that like, oh, it, it's something that we know exactly what it is and we want to contest it in um, specific ways. My entry into this was to argue that I don't think we've said enough yet about what growth actually is, at least in um, the present day. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of built out some of my analysis of growth by thinking about how, like, um, there's a quote that Hannah Appel writes at the beginning of her book, The Licit Life of Capitalism, that came out a couple of years ago, um, where she writes that capitalism is not a context, it is a project. And I am trying to apply that same type of argument to growth. Growth is not a context or a big statistical abstraction or a reality we are able to take for granted, but it's a project. And it's a project that is reenacted every day with every micro level interaction um so um with that in mind i you know did uh, built out some research on peru where um entrepreneurs basically are um working to build up businesses in areas of expanding mining and so i looked at those two forms of localized growth together uh and try to suggest that um both take on this extractive model, but in the interactions that constitute them, there's some really interesting things that you start to notice that I'm happy to get into in some detail as we proceed. Um, but that's sort of the overview of my entry into um, some of these conversations. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Very interesting as well. Uh, Shifani, how uh, do you relate to, to the growth and degrowth? I um, want to start also by thanking everybody, and I'm enjoying listening already to your your kind of yeah encounters with degrowth. Um, I'm from Kashmir, a little bit west of this uh, part of the Himalayas, a region that has been colonized thrice over, if you want, uh, by India, Pakistan, and China. So I kind of grew up um, knowing about the ravages of uh, economic growth and specifically its colonial dimensions, uh, expansion. Of the market and, and its incredible resource base in the Himalayas. Um, so this personal rooting is what informs uh, my research interests in how capitalist growth and colonial science specifically impact co collective health and well-being. So I'm really on the health and science uh, front of degrowth research and the critiques of growth. Um, I'm also interested ultimately in how science and health might be done differently and I do this from a setting that hasn't been directly colonized, specifically Bhutan, which is kind of well known for its critiques of growth and, and a kind of post-growth philosophy of development, gross national happiness. I work in this Himalayan region also because it has a compelling ecological and historical context, multi-species complexity, religious syncretism, geographical affordances for also political flight, uh, this, in context to even begin to think about how post-growth living and refusal might be done in practice. Um, I am interested um, in my doctoral work um, in complicating three assumptions about uh, economic growth, post-growth, and well-being. Uh, and one of the most persistent of these is that justification we often hear about economic growth um, supposedly leading to, linearly, um, greater human health. And in earlier mixed methods of research, I was interested in changing body norms in Eastern Bhutan, actually in this campus. Um, and the undergraduate women I was doing field work with reported increasing mental health issues, precisely because of the pressures of expanding labor markets and globalizing beauty ideals. So in this uh, one generation of change um, from largely agrarian labor, where 96% of women were farming, uh, smallholders, we see a, a huge transition to wage labor. And with that comes an incredible reduction in mental health uh, well and well-being. So this is one of the kind of unexpected uh, side effects of the transition to kind of capitalist modernity and, and specifically the obsession with 
economic growth, even in a post-growth setting, um, because the institutions of growth are, are multiple. Um, and uh, neoclassical economists, meanwhile, here have been excited about the extension of wage labor um, and also about nutrition. Um, there's an interest here in uh, proving that economic growth leads to greater physical health, specifically infant growth. And that's what my present research is really about. I, I'm trying to unpack this linear relationship, again, assumed between uh, economic growth and babies growing. Somehow that uh, this assumption is still um, really persistent. And the first thousand days is this big research agenda trying to prove that um, conception to the second birthday is like a golden window of opportunity. Um, and I, I'm kind of interested in, in the frictions that emerge uh, when actors put these maternal and child nutrition interventions into practice or refuse them in this post-growth uh, non-colonial Giovanni, I think we lost you a little bit. Until your connection reestablishes, uh, maybe I can invite Jos to. And in a paper I'm oh. working on with Bhutanese colleagues, precisely argue that a post growth approach to health was the reason Bhutan has the lowest case fatality ratio due to COVID 19 in the world, only 21 deaths. And it has to do with the longer historical refusal of uh, capitalist uh, institutions. And then the last um, myth that we're trying to unpack is a, a tacit ideological assumption that economic growth is um, mirrored in human nature itself, that we have a longing for constant expansion. Um, and along with friends in this Embody Grow co Collective um, from the Degrowth Conference in, in The Hague in uh, 2021, we, we work on not only tracing how human, in 2020, uh, we work on not only tracing how human natures might be done in multiple ways, not only in growthist, expansionist, anthropocentric ways, but also on embodying degrowth movements themselves and degrowth research um, and science as a practice. So thinking about how we do our, our methods, but also how we do events like this, academic spaces and uh, productivism in our daily life as researchers. Mm. Wow. Yeah, so many issues there from, from baby growth to, to whether it's in our na human nature and, and of course our own practices. So we will come to hopefully many of those issues. Joost, can I invite you to, to reflect on your journey through growth land? <laughs> <laughs> or degrowth land. And degrowth land. land. Yeah. So uh, Caroline and, and the others, uh, members of the uh, ABV, thanks very much for the, uh, for the invitation. I feel very privileged to be here today and, and share uh, thoughts about growth and degrowth. Um, I, I, want to, I would like to start on a personal note, and I'm really happy that, uh, that Shivani brought in a perspective on children, because I happen to be a father of two young children. I'm a father of two daughters. Uh, my oldest is uh, almost 11, and the youngest is almost uh, 8. Um, so they're, they're still relatively young children, and, um, and, and I must say that I'm really worried about their future. Uh, I'm really, really worried about the sort of future that, that lies ahead of them, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure if it will be, uh, if, if it will be a, 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 um, yeah, a future that has been as, uh, as prosperous and positive as, as mine has been. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried on a personal note. Um, also, I've, I've, during the past few years, begin to rethink my own life. So I've stopped eating meat for that reason. Um, we sold the family car because um, th that felt like uh, uh, not like a good thing to do to co to continue uh, using uh, uh, fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> so there are there are a couple of, of personal consequences uh, as well. Uh, even though, and that's a bit of an irony, I'm relatively new to the debate to the debate on degrowth. Um, actually, when when Caroline invited me for this session. Um, I was at first a little bit surprised, and I'll, I'll tell you in, in a moment why, because I'm more on the growth side than I'm on the degrowth side. But I went back in my memory and, and I realized that uh, I'm a reader of The New Yorker, um, that about three years ago I read a, uh, I read a piece uh, written by John Cassidy with the title, Can We Have Prosperity Without Growth? And I think that's the first time when, uh, when I was pointed at, at, um, at the intellectual debate that surrounds degrowth and the, uh, the, the piece in the New Yorker actually reviews a couple of uh, both, well, pieces, books from economics, but also 
uh, political science, uh, psychology, and a couple of other uh, disciplines, um, sort of state of current state of affairs in, in degrowth discussions. And I was really uh, intrigued by that. But at the time, I, I didn't do, do much with it and, uh, uh, at all. So I just thought it was really interesting. <clears throat> then uh, Caroline invited me for this uh, today's session. <clears throat> And then I realized, well, hang on, maybe I do have something to say <laughs> about this. Um, and that something uh, is very much in the sphere of my one of my research passions, which is the study of entrepreneurship. So I've been studying uh, various cases of entrepreneurship um, during the past 20 years or so, which have now culminated in this, uh, this new book that, uh, that will appear uh, in June, published by Berghahn. Um, and over the past 20 years, I've studied entrepreneurship in various different contexts. I've, I've studied second-hand car dealers in West Africa. Uh, I've studied uh, fishermen on Lake Victoria exporting uh, fish to overseas markets in, uh, in North, uh, Northwest Europe, also America. Um, I've looked into fish, uh, fish trade, fish producers in Greece, uh, and I've looked a little bit in in to financial traders in uh, bankers in financial America. And what unites all of, all, all of these cases, I mean, they're different for, for, for many different reasons, obviously, but what, what unites them is that, that all of them are, um, they have a special relation with the future in the sense that all of them are situated in, in what could be called uh, global frontiers. Um, and I'm, I've become very interested in the, in the course of, well, the past 20 years, in the question how uh, the, 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 the frontier nature of particular forms of entrepreneurship, how, how, that, how that goes about. Uh, there's this famous uh, point by Anat Singh, who remarks that frontiers come with a particular savage sentiment, and the idea that, that it's possible to start something new, to, to reinvent oneself in a way, um, uh, often imagining the future as something that's open-ended, uh, that's, that's, that's moldable, that's fluid, flexible, and so on. Um, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm interested in that. I'm especially interested in the images, dreams, hopes, aspirations, and so on, that, that are in a way projected onto the future by various forms of entrepreneurship. And of course, when talking about entrepreneurs, th there's growth plays a very special role. I think many uh, underpinning many types of entrepreneurship and on entrepreneurial behavior is, is an idea or an, uh, an ideal, I should say, of growth, of expansion, of capital accumulation, or whatever you would like to call that, and and there is, of course, the I think the the point where my interest uh, I think uh, uh, resonate with the interest of this panel is that uh, that the idea of capital accumulation is, of course, very central to analysis of how global capitalism works, right? Um, and that brings me to another to a second point that has attracted me to this panel, which is that I think that. Um, uh, that 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 uh, any discussion, any analysis, any uh, perspective on degrowth, to my uh, to my mind, should have a place for a discussion about uh, the economic actors that are central in it, which are entrepreneurs uh, by and large. Entrepreneurs run companies. Uh, co companies uh, uh, they produce products that we all draw and depend on, but they also pollute. Um, they also, there are all, all sorts of built-in inefficiencies that have unintended consequences that, that many of us are suffering from and will suffer in the near future uh, in our everyday lives. Um, and I think that, that whereas entrepreneurs may be seen as part of the problem, they can also be seen, in my view, as part of the solution towards a, 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 a degrowth or degrowing world. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in or very motivated by, by trying to explore that a little bit further, mm -hmm. um, which I, I haven't done much so far. So I see yeah, an important challenge in participating in today's panel to, uh, to try to achieve that a little bit more. Yeah, thank you so much, Joost. Um, so maybe first we dig into, into well, you all uh, mentioned some uh, that you engage with with the issue of growth and especially Eric and Joost. Uh, maybe I can ask you, based on your work with entrepreneurs, uh, you already started um, 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 some with some reflections about this, Joost, and also with your, your work, uh, Eric, on Peruvian villages. How uh, could you, well, how do you 
describe how growth looks like in everyday life? You know, you mentioned it's a project in which we all engage in, Eric. How does that, um, well, where does it come from? What, what are its effects on, on those in daily lives? Could you elaborate a little? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, so I think of growth, uh, let me give three episodes as a sort of example to give some, um, you know, material content for our discussion. So I wanna, uh, so these are three episodes, all of them represent localized small scale efforts to extend the frontiers of growth within the rural Andes in Peru. Um, so yeah, the first act is inseminating a cow. I talk, uh, all of these I talk about in my book, but uh, the first act, inseminating a cow, this is taking place in the rural surrounding environment next to an expanding mine, the Tintaya Antapakai mine in Espinar, Peru. Um, one of their corporate social responsibility programs involves hiring veterinary technicians to circulate the surrounding highlands and help out with the um, bovine livestock and, you know, is sort of um, genetically enhance them by um, uh, kind of the flagship contribution in addition to basic veterinary care is to inseminate local cows with European brown Swiss sperm and a couple of other European breeds in order to um, make the a new generation of hybrid cow uh, hybrid cattle uh, more able to uh, efficiently so-called or cheaply produce um, milk and meat while being more resilient to increasingly hot and dry highlands and so the insemination is this flagship contribution that the mine makes to local communities to sort of bring them on board with the mine's vision of regional growth to make the the rural community members feel like they are growing and to make them feel like they're growing as a specific result of living near the mine thus seeding um you know local approval of the mine or at least dividing up the local community between people who strongly resist and actively protest against the mine and people who approve of it and want it to stay because of its effect on um, their own well-being. So that, that work of insemination, you know, it's um, when growth is often described in kind of taken for granted terms as frictionless and as we see just this like expansion of prosperity on the ground, the act of insemination is quite violent and difficult and um you know anybody who is interested in kind of the anthropology of non-human animal studies and views animals as ethical beings um that is nothing short of a sexual assault so um sort of like this violence of growth um uh, in the guise of caring for humans and i call that idea extractive care um in in my book. Um, the second episode, um, less directly violent, uh, involves more of the kind of discursive interactional dimensions of growth. And that is um, where an entrepreneur, uh, the leader of an entrepreneurial group from a Highland community called Tutti, presents advances that they have done as a result of a development project. And I just want to read um, a quick quote from that. Um, so this is a woman who represents an association for um, commercializing alpaca wool, uh, and alpaca fiber and meat, and she is presenting um, to the public in the context of a development competition at the end of this three-year-long development program. And I'm just gonna read a quick bit of, of this woman's speech, which I've translated into English. We've managed to transform artisanal threads as they are in diverse colors and have come to transform by giving value added to scarves, the poncho I've displayed here, shawls, hats, and gloves with this value added. We've given to our wool a high value added, for example, this poncho here, holding it up, which we are selling for 100 soles. Apart from giving a value added, we've given laborers jobs in our locality since the artisans of our district are creating and elaborating them. So that like, repeated um, 
almost nervous return to the term value added is this um, enacting growth as it's also aspiring for it. Finally, a third quick episode um, comes in the form of a development office agent going to visit one of the entrepreneurs that the development project had invested in and sort of coaching them through business strategies. In this case, the entrepreneur was named Silvia and she um, was building up a bake shop. And so um, that episode takes place as there's some negotiation and a, and a kind of um, tutoring on how best to advertise, do promotion deals, um, deal with like uh, customer rhythms, choose the best location for the business, um, and just deal with the, the more affective and psychological dimensions of how it is really hard to um, put in the energy and emotional labor of running a business that's open all day or that's open at hours that makes sense for customers. Um, so those are, are kind of the three brief episodes where growth becomes this um, this ideal that's extended from person to person and even into the non-human uh, world. I'll leave that there for now. Yeah, so a project and an ideal that's extended so that is how growth for you looks like and Joost uh, you you of course did research you already mentioned with, with entrepreneurs across the, the globe uh maybe can you give a brief notion of how then growth that figures there how how does it what size is shape does it take and do you see this project and also this notion of of um well ideal uh, do you see that coming up there as well yeah, okay. So uh, I'm very thankful for uh, Eric's, uh, Eric's short presentation because I can link up to especially the second episode. Um, uh, let me first say why I'm thankful because it rhymes with my own uh, idea in the sense that it's important to distinguish in the growth degrowth discussion on the one hand the, let's say, political and ideological implications. And I understand that much of the literature engages with that it's to some extent utopian so what would a, you know, an ideal degrowing world uh, perhaps uh, look like and what are the perils of growth and so on and so forth um, and there's that but i'm more attracted in my work to uh, to contributing to understanding so what growth uh, in practice means so growth as a or degrowth as a as a practice or as a project uh, and especially the second episode that uh, that Eric mentioned, so the the repeated, almost nervous uh, usage of the of the term value added uh, adding, is something that that resonates uh, quite a bit with uh, with my own work, especially in uh, the West African second second hand car business, where I I came across something very peculiar, which was that on the one hand, the car dealers that uh, I hang out with on, on car markets in Cotonou and other places. They would endlessly, endlessly talk about, um, you know, how car business is a good business. So this was a term that would invariably uh, be mentioned uh, in any conversation, uh, to the point that I, that I find began to find it quite tiresome and, and uh, got irritated with it. Um, uh, of course, at first I thought, well, you know, if if all of these traders are sort of uh, repeating how great and how uh, profitable the car business is, then that's probably, you know. That holds a lot of truth, but then after a couple of months into the field, I got access to uh, to some of the bookkeeping of several of the car dealers, and I discovered that that uh, that um, uh, that not many of them were making a profit. Actually, most of my informants weren't making much money or were losing money. So the riddle of my study be became to explain how, on the one hand, there is a language that that consistently emphasizes business success or entrepreneurial success on the one hand and on the other hand if you look at the entrepreneurship as a as an economic practice uh, much uh, capital was dissipated was disappearing uh, was ev being evaporated and of course th th this was a very it was a breaking breakthrough moment in my study uh, because it forced me to you know to to uh, uh, to to reframe my questions and I, I came to appreciate how this language refers very much to an idealized state. It's wishful thinking, perhaps it's a dream or whatever you would like to, to call it. And it's a collective dream. So the collectiveness and the way this dream was uh, was reproduced and also guarded at the boundaries 
so to say that became a uh, became a, a stri a di well a difficult point for understanding and it's also brought me to um, uh, to the realization that understanding growth itself isn't so easy uh, understanding growth as an, an outsider term as a term that's uh, infused with an economist economist uh, conceptions of capital accumulation and so on only goes so far in understanding the the, the nature of entrepreneurial uh, behavior um, so uh, here yeah so I think that that's what I came up with and what Eric was sharing I think pointed towards the same direction that that we may talk we can talk about growth and degrowth uh, but not without understanding how growth and degrowth work uh, as a practice yeah so again here growth is an idealized state as a dream uh, and as a um, something that comes in many forms so maybe now shift to um, Shivani and Liz um, well the degrowth let's say discourse and, and field is very critical of growth as well. So how do you look at these stories that these notions of, of, um, of growth as a dream, as a, as an ideal, and why do you think those are maybe problematic or what have you seen about this in, in your work? Can I give Shivani maybe first? Thanks, Caroline. Um, it's really interesting to think about entrepreneurs and how they do uh, growth, the tensions they live with, yeah. The, the projects they pursue, um, and then the violence that emerges. I, I think a lot about, um, I mean, like coming out of the post-development critiques of, of, of violence of development also, um, that's how I personally also first started writing about degrowth or reading about it. And I, I think personally, I, I am sitting in the, in the, I think debates around alienation, very much what happens to labor when we talk about capital, um, you know, natural capital in the case of cows or resources, the, the language used for, for human labor in, in growth terms is human capital. And at least in my previous work, much more about growth and the extension of wage labor. Um, it was striking to me how much uh, there was a shift from the use of the body to an exchange of the body. Um, and to give you an example, so I was interviewing a lot of um, undergraduate women they're at this uh, share of psychology, which is considered the peak of higher education in the country. So they've passed all these exams, they're considered the cream of the crop, but with that comes an immense pressure um, to achieve not only academically, but also then office jobs. And at a time when they're exposed uh, dramatically to new body norms, uh, Korean, American, Indian, not necessarily only um, what would be colloquially Western ideas, but really a kind of capitalist body norms about what uh, a fit body should be exchanged for the kind of aesthetic capital that uh, um, an office worker is supposed to achieve, as opposed to a body that is capable of, of work. And, and the term that um, one of these students I was interviewing described really beautifully is beja, or the idea of a kind of care, um, the capacity for, um, conduct, self-conduct, and ability to work for another, a, a kind of conscientiousness and empathy. Um, and she gave an example, you know, somebody who thinks that a guest needs water, etc. That would have been the conception of um, beauty before. And with these body norms that emphasize a physicality and therefore a kind of exchange of the body, you, you lose the emphasis or as well as the practice of those kinds of skills. There is, there's a tension between um, what you're expected to use the body for. It's really much more an exchange uh, context. So it, it ends up uh, la layering an immense amount of um, pressure on young women here, um, where one generation ago, not only were they doing um, agrarian work, their mother's generation, but there was a very different conception of beauty associated mm -hmm. with also beja um, and the physicality uh, symbolically is called the chengedawa or the full moon face, um, a kind of fullness of body that represented the ability to, to care for others, um, which is now considered um, not obese, but, but not healthy. Um, and there, there is still a persistence of that idea. It becomes a type of uh, protection in a way to have contact with that kind of beauty norm. Mm -hmm through uh, elders, elder women, aunts, uh, it becomes a kind of protection from 
the, the multiple new uh, kind of capitalist beauty norms and um, that are entering through various sources. But I, I, I find it fascinating that uh, what you would think is uh, considered good, you know, employment rates are going up, but it's also because it's based on a type of violent appropriation of, of um, labor that would not have been explicitly valued or measured before um, because it was not waged and, and therefore not based on a, on a formal salary. Um, and with that come new tensions uh, and from classic Marxist language, alienation really from the body. And in, in the Bhutanese context, there is a language for what uh, would have been considered a kind of use of, of one's labor, um, beja, just thinking out loud. And growth itself, um, yeah, there's a lot to say more on statistically, the, the use of that measure when it becomes uh, mm. a single universal equivalent that travels so easily or quickly. Um, and this is uh, written about more extensively um, in the critiques of the one world world. Um, and I'm thinking here of feminist science studies, uh, John Law, and, and the special issue that I'd working, been working on with a few colleagues, really looking at the alternatives to this one world world of economic growth only as the measure and the ideal. Um, and you would have so many, you would have a, a kaleidoscope of, of examples of people resisting this universalism of one metric and one goal. Um, and, and they don't have to be formalized in, in state policies like gross national happiness. That is one example. We can talk more about that in another round maybe, but um, I agree with Jost. I think it, it's interesting that we don't use a term like capital accumulation to talk about economic growth more explicitly um, and more honestly. I think there's a tendency to biologize very quickly. Uh, economic growth as a natural phenomenon and therefore link it to the human body and that's at the level of the imaginary and what people grow into um, and again something we can talk about another time I want to hear from me sorry go ahead Lise sure thank you very much all of you it's just it's yeah super interesting to to listen to this and I'm wondering if it could be helpful um you know Caroline you asked about um kind of why is growth problematic? So I'm just wondering, rather than talking about my own research, maybe to just kind of um, talk a little bit about degrowth and then the critique of, of growth, um, you know, because degrowth is this sort of multifaceted term or this kind of umbrella term for um, a lot of different kind of movements. And, um, but if we want to kind of boil it down, then it has, they're kind of two major critiques of, of perpetual economic growth. And just thinking with what Shivani was saying about growth and the body, that there that growth, you know, and, and degrowth scholars themselves have admitted that degrowth is an unappealing term um, because of the sort of positive connotations that we have with growth as a central element of life. So I thought maybe I would just very briefly kind of go over the sort of the critique of perpetual economic growth which as I'm sure everyone here knows is um, initially that limitless economic growth is incompatible with a finite planet. So it uses up finite resources and in the process produces waste products which pollute and sicken on a massive scale, you know, plastic pollution to carbon dioxide. And secondly, that it relies on um, exploitation and expropriation of the majority of the world's population. And, therefore contributes to this massive inequality and suffering, including, um, as Shivani was saying, of the commodification of, of bodies. And actually, I would love if, if maybe if we have time later and Shivani can talk more about this because, you know, she's worked on also the psychological and, and affective impact of, um, of growth, you know, kind of toxic stress and burnout and an epidemic of loneliness. Um, which is another kind of major uh, critique of, of, of growth um, or of perpetual economic growth. Um, and as I said, there are all these connotations with growth of, of abundance and um, uh, fulfillment and uh, life. And so I think, you know, one of the books that I found most interesting recently was um, 
for, for sort of capturing what perpetual economic growth is, is Julie Livingston's um, self-devouring growth, right? And she's worked on cancer before. So this, this idea of this perpetual growth as something which is not in fact natural. Um, and then I wondered if, you know, a, another sort of, a, a sort of counter critique often leveled at um, degrowth is its association with, you know, recession or austerity. Um, and that, you know, degrowth scholars have, have pointed out that, that recession and austerity are actually a, a product of perpetual growth and of boom and bust um, cycles. And that degrowth is actually, in a certain sense, about a kind of growth and investment in um, certain sectors. Um, maybe this is where the entrepreneurs can come in also. Um, so, you know, this kind of um, last stimulus that degrowth scholars talk about in education, healthcare, social security, welfare, re regenerative agriculture, um, you know, this, this building also of these kind of landscapes of public affluence, um, these kind of commons. So, and, and what degrowth is actually trying to downsize is, you know, the military, the fossil fuel industry, the banking sector, what Graeber called bullshit jobs. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I just wanted to sort of put that out there when we're thinking about degrowth, what, what is it that, that we're really thinking about? Um, and I think that Yorgos Kalis and his colleagues in, in their 2020 book, uh, the, the case for degrowth put it very well, which is that the case for degrowth is a case for stopping the pursuit of growth, this perpetual economic growth, and for reorienting lives and societies towards well-being, which is what Shivani was talking about at the beginning as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think from from your 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 stories as well as your your uh, analysis, we see that growth is 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 a, a beast with many faces, <laughs> uh, faces that present themselves in in such a context as insemination of a cow, which uh, well you um, you discussed um, very um, explicitly, <laughs> Eric uh, to best selling a car and there's this reinforcing notion of it's a good business, as well as it, it presents itself to the body and in negative, very negative ways, well, to the aesthetics that you, you talked about, Shivani, and of course, also on the planetary uh, um, level. So, well, I don't think today we can really get into the bot to the bottom of what growth means, but of course, uh, taking into account these many faces is important. Um, and uh, also really great, um, Liz, that you talked about what degrowth then proposes to this, because that is, this is what I would like to go in next, you know, um, next to the, um, the more economic and metabolic, metabolic uh, changes that degrowth uh, proposes or quite radically wants to transform. Um, degrowth is not only material, but also primarily maybe cultural, you know, I, I think Susan Paulson was many times mentioned already here. She wrote about this uh, in this uh, special issue that was mentioned. So um, for Liz and Shivani, could I invite you to, to think about what cultural changes, um, what does this cultural change that is needed? Well, until, according to you, and how could our work as anthropologists contribute to this and, and to the understanding of what it and what it takes to de to to degrow. Lise, would you like to start? Sure. I can maybe provide a, a sort of very basic um, initial um, thoughts that, that we can build on. Um, so maybe three things that, that anthropologists might um, contribute to, to degrowth movements and to degrowth scholarship. Um, I guess the first is kind of challenging this hegemony of growth. Um, you know, that, 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 <laughs> that this kind of mode of knowing, as it's, it's sometimes been called, um, this kind of growth mode is global and you know it's displaced other worldviews and, and life worlds um and it's provided a kind of inability to see anything but growth so that the solutions to the current crisis that we face are green growth or you know um, technological advancements for carbon capture or that kind of thing that, that there isn't the possibility for a radical alternative um 
and anthropology obviously from its beginnings has privileged uh, other modes of knowing and being um, and you know increasingly has has even sort of pointed to heterogeneous um, ways of knowing and being and doing even within communities and and emphasizing issues of, of power and, and difference within communities um, or social groups. So as I sort of said at the beginning, degrowth scholars have drawn on published ethnographies to, to counteract these, these kind of modes of thought. Um, and you know, a way in which contemporary anthropology can contribute is by, um, I think, building on the work of anthropologists like Arturo Escobar um, and, you know, his concept of the pluriverse, um, which I really like the way that um, Richard Norgaard describes it, which is a world in which diverse hopes can be sown, multiple opportunities can be cultivated, um, and a plurality of meaningful lives can be achieved. So really this sort of, um, this this kind of um, questioning of of, um, of the, the the hegemony of growth, um, and then secondly, kind of opening up alternative possibilities. So, um, in their article on uh, anthropology and activism, Ulrich Demmer and his colleagues write about. Um, the, the, the activist communities that they're working with, searching for new concepts that can help them go beyond dualist frameworks or, or other kinds of um, uh, contradictions that they encounter. And, um, and the way in which Demma is able to contribute to this by offering um, uh, the concept of the rhizome, or you might think of the comparative method in anthropology and the fact that it can offer these alternative kind of concepts and, and ways of, of, of seeing and, and being. Um, and there's this book called the, the Happiness Dictionary, which catalogues words from different languages um, that are unique to that language, but that um, uh, evoke a kind of well-being that that isn't even conceptualized in other languages and I think that you know we all know the kind of the power of a concept in making something um, tangible and so anthropology kind of can on the one hand um, question the hegemony of growth and on the other offer alternative possibilities and then finally and I'll hand over to to um, Shivani but there's sort of the ethnographic contribution, um, you know, contemporary ethnographies of, of um, social groups living outside of the growth paradigm or, you know, intentional communities or, um, or within the margins or challenging this sort of, again, what is within the realm of the possible. Um, and I think something that might be even more important than contributing to these sort of utopian visions might be to ask, you know, what goes wrong in these social groups? Because inevitably in a society where, you know, everything must be shared, there are going to be people who take more than their fair share. So how have, um, how have different social groups managed that? How, yeah, how have, how have different social groups managed when things go wrong or when conflict arises? Because the most important thing I think in, in, you know, you have to think big and, and think kind of utopian, but you also have to kind of prepare for what could go wrong um, or, or where conflict could arise or where um, power imbalances could exist. Um, yeah, in, in order to kind of uh, not have this sort of like noble savage kind of um, slot that, that we're again kind of falling into. Um, yeah. I have a few more thoughts, but I think we can talk about them in the discussion. Shivani, would you like to add? I think you you also covered um, points that I would have loved to make. I, I'm absolutely thinking about the pluriverse and as well as some of the frictions that emerge when um, you try to come up with alternatives to a universe um, and, and the specific universal term we were playing with is in this special issue was a sustainable development and how it i mean i think it's goal eight sdg eight that reifies already economic growth once again um as an outcome of again wage labor like it's assumed that this is part of sustainability um it's yet to be unpacked uh and there would be 
lots of examples all around us, as you say, to, to start to think flexibly, um, uh, sensitively about the kinds of small uh, and scale alternatives to sustainable development that people might have not even uh, language for, and, and whether you can, uh, especially as an anthropologist, have a role to play in documenting them as case studies. Um, in this special issue, we happen to have people from very different types of scales of movement, um, everything from eco-villages in the Yucatan, um, working with nature, doing science differently, um, to cultivate plants and, and crops and also community, um, and some of the frictions that come with that um, uh, differentiation within that community. And then another like much broader scale is Rojava um, and the Kurdish resistance movement, the practice of genealogy and how it takes an untraining of a particular relationship again to science of a dominant kind, one that separates um, human anthropos um, and knowing through other forms. Um, and again, as anthropologists, we have, as you say, least the, the privilege and the honor to be able to talk about other epistemologies. Um, I have some issues with the term pluriverse because the, the lineage also is um, uh, Carl Schmidt, who was uh, the legal theorist of the Third Reich. And I think it's an interesting example of where degrowth also has been used towards ethno-nationalist ends. I'm not saying that the pluriverse is to be thrown out, but there, the emphasis on difference and, and the opposite or diverging trajectories is also one made by um, increasingly nationalist movements um, and it's something to keep an eye on when we emphasize again like any kind of differentiation how do we make the terms of the commons as you say um, uh, and that takes time care and relational work and that, that's I think at least when we talk about radical transformation Caroline um, what I wish we had more time for as scientists and as researchers how to make the time to take your time with uh, the people you work with, but also other disciplines. Uh, and I, I would love to see that. I think in degrowth, there is um, a lot of interdisciplinary interest. So we're an example of that here, um, but there would be a, a lot of room for, I think, collaboration between, um, you know, the kind of more humanistic uh, side of degrowth, which is, clearly there already from the 60s onwards, the two Chanel were also influenced deeply by psychoanalysis. It's a kind of lost strand at the moment. Anthropology, economic anthropologists like Kaye also completely informing uh, present work in degrowth, but it, it's as, as uh, Lise points out, a kind of dropped agenda perhaps, at least in anthropology today, and something that can be revived, of course. But um, I, I'm fond of multidisciplinary collaborations, um, and that takes also friendship and time. Um, I, I feel I, I learn immensely. I think it's another way to do science as well, is to really work with, uh, but, um, yeah, in the same discipline necessarily, but seeking difference where possible. I'm in the process of a collaboration here across different departments, and we're going to get into some disagreements likely because some of them are economists, but I, I feel that's part of the... <laughs> Um, agenda or my, my interest in, in trying to also move away from the hubris of Anthropos that has generated a lot of the problems um, of capitalist expansion is this need to know and to control. I link this also to the, the um, obsession with uh, universalistic uh, metrics, yeah. which again have their purposes, but when they are the only source of um, progress or the definition of progress, we have a problem. Um, so just kind of broadly, I, I would say as, as echoing at least like to vernacularize degrowth, to maybe decenter also the language of degrowth would be key. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, there's an incredible entrepreneur ne network, which I think speaks more closely to symbolic meaning of outgrowing something as opposed to only degrowing. Mm. I think we have much more political possibility when we look at vernacularizing the language mm. of um, degrowth, uh, Ubuntu, Tendril, there would be so many examples wow. um, people have already been working on. Um, multiple alternatives. Yeah, so, um, so vernacularizing, I feel that's also the role of the anthropologist to, to bring to the fore um, and then to multiply growth 
itself. I, I'm, I'm wary of collapsing and deferring in a way, like putting in a box all growth as instances of the economy moving or changing. I, I, I refuse to cede that ground. I would prefer, and, and I'm also thinking of Susan Livings, I mean, um, Julie Livingston's book on self-devouring growth. She questions whether um, there is a type of nourishing growth. And I think that's very possible to do in ethnographic practice. And, and I actually would love to see that happening more, um, opening up what growth um, can be outside of the economistic uh, capture. Um, and then thirdly, I'm kind of interested in this in, in daily life. You do talk about this a little bit, but how to do post-growth human natures, you know, to find pleasure and joy and actually setting collective limits is not unthinkable. In fact, it is pretty well observed in, in psychoanalysis and other models of um, child observation. Um, and I'm coming from a kind of clinical background there thinking we have lots of alternative uh, human natures to pick from, we, we can construct. Um, and uh, that's partly deeper work <laughs> to do over generations, so. Thank you so much both Lisa and, and Giovanni, right? Really rich uh, reflections on conceptual, uh, methodological, as well as, um, um, yeah, the, what, what the work of, of anthropologists can, can do uh, in relation to degrowth. So, I would, um, I'm very curious how, how Joost uh, as well as Eric uh, see this, uh, especially from maybe the context from which you talk and, and the research uh, with the actors that you've done and, and, and in the context that you've done, how do you see this degrowth agenda and this debate? How do you see this, especially from those contexts? Um, Joost, could I give you the floor first? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, there's two things I would like to say. The first thing is that links up, uh, I think, mostly with Shivani's comments is that that I feel uh, I feel a bit um, I hesitate a little bit to be on the side of of actively advocating degrowth. Uh, I think that that's very fine from you know the safety of my privileged uh, tenured uh, position and so on. Uh, uh, so that that's that's that that I, I think I have an, an issue with that. So I think in the beginning of the session I made a distinction between degrowth as an ideological or political project on the one hand, and looking at practices of degrowth on the other hand. So I'm, I'm I think I'm more firmly on that side, um, and reasons from that, and, and also being a practical researcher, uh, I like to think about this in terms of of concrete themes that I that I could or my students could further. A further study um, and and all, I mean yeah so, some of which are related to entrepreneurship obviously but some aren't I, I guess but but a couple of things that come to my mind is that um, and again also linking to Shivani's point earlier about the about labor and the body uh, and so on that that brought me to my mind that in the Western world uh, uh, um, at least there's there's a big issue with what's called voluntary work and voluntary work, that very term exists as an opposite to, to wage to wage work or paid work. And I think that that one of the implications of um, of the foreseeable degrowing economies uh, could very well be that uh, that there will be a larger availability of uh, of men and women power that can be uh, that can be organized in in what's called voluntary work. Yet the very nature of voluntary work remains uh, poorly understood. So there are studies here and there, but many coming from, from applied sciences, I would say. But how meanings of voluntary work uh, evolve um, and al also how, for instance, voluntary work and, uh, and status considerations are related, for instance, is something that remains, uh, I think, poorly understood. And I think that this falls very, very well within a degrowth agenda. Would be very well an upcoming team. Uh, what what the, at least I would be interested uh, in that. Um, more material maybe example could be that that we're talking a lot about the waste economy and and how capitalist expansion and capitalist growth uh, coincides with with uh, pollution and and uh, whatnot. Uh, Elise also uh, uh, commented on that a little bit. But I think that within the degrowth agenda, that the extending of life cycles of products. Is, is, is becoming an important theme. Um, 
So the, you know, the second hand shops, for instance, the repair shops um, are, would be examples and more abstract, I guess, that how the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the extension of product life cycles impacts on consumer identities. I mean, the, the very idea of, of, of capitalist expansion and the rise of middle classes, middle class consumption uh, and so on. There, there's a very intimate and also well documented connection there but how this is changing under uh, under under changing ideas of what what uh, what products constitute and how the extend extension of of, uh, of life cycles of products uh, looks like that's i think also a very interesting uh, interesting um, interesting topic to be explored and the third theme that that i that i think may be worthwhile to to further look at is that that obviously capitalist growth and expansion uh, also documented by uh, by Piketty and Graeber and others uh, coincides with growing inequalities and uh, socioeconomic inequalities uh, but parallel to that are discussions about basic income right and uh, that applies to in the countries that many of you come from um, however the, the discussions on how basic incomes look like or could look like there have been experiments here and there um, to, to my knowledge, are very much informed by by, by econo economists, political scientists, and so on. Uh, but a, uh, an anthropological perspective that looks at everyday everyday practices, um, uh, for instance, also how how basic income, living, and dignity are are related. For instance, is something that's that's poorly understood. I think. Um, so these are yeah these are examples of themes that come to my mind when I when I think about the degrowth de de uh, agenda. No. But again, I'm, I'm relatively new to this debate, so I'm here more today, I'm more learning from your contributions, uh, I guess. So. Thank you very much, Joost. Erik, would you like to reflect on what? Of course, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think, I guess in terms of um, how anthropology could contribute to um, debates on growth and degrowth. I've got um, three quick ideas and, I, and I'll go through these as fast as I can. Um, first, uh, the types of localized work we're trying to build together um, helps us remind ourselves uh, that growth is not this all powerful, all dominating thing. Um, and so some of my work has built on the basic premise of some uh, last couple of decades of feminist critiques of capitalism, saying that capitalism is not something we should automatically um, see as this all dominating, uh, like crushing figure, but as something that is regularly made and remade and can be engaged with in different and all kinds of uh, diverse heterogeneous ways. Um, and so I think, again, we can have some of that same analysis as useful for thinking about growth. Second, um, some newer anthropological work, um, some of where I'd like to go next with my own work and, and some others I've been in conversation with, are trying to think about what adjusting our lives to climate change is going to look like. And it seems as if, and this is sort of a hypothesis I'm, you know, going to like, test over the next few years, it seems as if mainstream capital A adaptation projects are essentially figuring out how to grow during climate change. So not really um, engaging directly with the structures that got us here, but just seeing climate change as simply closing off certain pathways to growth so we have to move over to others. Um, and so we could have a role of really calling that out and problematizing those moves. Um, and the third thing, I just, I really love this line. Um, it came from Rebecca Solnit, who was uh, the guest geographer at the American Association of Geographers conference last weekend that I was attending. And she was suggesting that a lot of the anxiety around restructuring our lives for um, climate change and trying to mitigate our impacts on the planet um, are based on this assumption that we'd be having to transition from an age of abundance to one of austerity when 
there is just as real a possibility that we are currently in the age of austerity and the things we can do and the choices we can make next can actually bring about an age of abundance. And I just found that really um, useful and hopeful in a field that is mostly critique and um, pushback. And so I think that um, building out ethnographic evidence for how those forms of um, non-extractive abundance can come about it can be a really powerful contribution. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, actually, for for reflecting on this question: what what anthropology could bring and and uh, to degrowth and how it also may influence our own discipline. You know, um, in view of time, we have some uh, fifteen minutes left. I would actually like to shift to the Q&A part of, of this. Um, I think you very well uh, lined out some dimensions, which are actually many dimensions of this, what we might think of as a post-growth or degrowth anthropology agenda when, that you especially working on, Lise. Um, but, you know, it, it, it really goes from questioning the naturalness um, of, of growth as a hegemonic idea um, well, all the methods and also, well, celebrating or at least, uh, uh, um, um, yeah, um, looking into all those alternatives, ways of knowing, um, conceptualizing and, and doing in relation to well-being and to create well-being in very non-growth uh, ways. So, um, some hands raised up in the air, but I have the feeling that we have to call it a day, don't uh, be productive, overproductive. We have, um, well, uh, care and degrowth activities waiting for us, I guess. So um, I would uh, um, like to thank all the speakers here uh, with us. Uh, also, all of you uh, participants uh, staying uh, and, and being here till the very end. Um, I think the, 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 well, this discussion only um, enlarged the, the debate and, and put more issues on the table from the bodily to the planetary issue, from the universe to the pluriverse, from, uh, well, from many dimensions. So thank you for that. Uh, it is a discussion to be continued, I guess. This is only the start, so I hope to see you soon in some other occasions, um, and there will be many. Also, please keep an eye on the future webinars of uh, of our organization. They are, uh, as this one, open for everyone interested around the globe. So, um, uh, well, have a look at that. You can connect to our, our Facebook. Um, and, well, thank you so much for being here today and to all our speakers. And, of course, to Yesu, who was joining me here uh, as a, a technical host. So. Great, uh, and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, you so thanks, Karine. Bye-bye.